All right. So we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, haven't graded the quizzes from this weekend, so I haven't seen the uh, the questions from this weekend. Some other obligations at at my day job um, came up, so I lost time this morning. Uh, but we had two questions left over from last week to uh, to do random questions. Um, why are hexagons always used in biochem? And actually, even more specifically, in ochem, we're we're going to talk about partly why that that is when we get to talk about these uh, molecular shapes. We talked about it a little bit um, on Friday, right? We talked about how if you have three groups, we use uh, BF3 as an example. That okay, well, if you have boron in the middle, the Lewis dot structure is going to look like. going to look like this for this molecule. This is a bit of a of an irregular one. I guess she's, I'll use BH3 instead. Um, BH3 is kind of weird because it's one of the few Lewis dot structures where you actually can't satisfy our criteria for a valid Lewis dot structure. Because if we start by setting it up like this, how many electrons, how many valence electrons do we have to work with for uh, BH3 here? We get one from each hydrogen, right? And then what do you get from boron? How many valence electrons for boron? Three, right? So when we actually start assigning electrons, we, we go through a normal process, put boron in the middle, hydrogen around the outside. How many electrons have I used? How many electrons did I have to work with? So there is no way that we can actually satisfy the, um, the uh, second criteria for our Lewis dot structure. Right? We can't get eight electrons in the valence for boron because there are only six electrons we have to work with. Um, so it's not like we can add a double bond or something like that. We get this sort of weird structure here, um, which is why I don't use this as an example too much, but it's a good example for starting to talk about how far away these bonds could be from each other. So even though this looks weird, this is actually the right structure here. Um, how did we rank how far these bonds could be from each other? It wasn't in terms of a distance. It was in terms of angles. You guys remember that? Yeah. We could, if, if we only had two groups of electrons around a central atom, we could have 180 degrees between them, right? We have three groups of electrons. I said three, so I wrote three. We have 120 degrees between each of these. What shape do you get if you take a whole bunch of 120 degree angles and make, make them into a polygon? you get a hexagon. So hexagons show up all the time in organic chemistry because this structure which is known as benzene is really really stable in a really really common structure. And so you see hexagons all over the place in biochemistry and in organic chemistry just because hexagons happen to be a really common shape based on the fact that's how we can get 120 degrees between all of these angles, which is where they're most stable. So we're going to talk a lot today about those Vesper geometries and these shapes, these three, these uh, 3D or in some cases 2D shapes. Um, but that's why you see a lot, so many hexagons showing up is mostly because the bond angles are right. It's just a stable molecule when you can have the right bond angles. Um, and then the other question we didn't get to on Friday was about uh, dating fossils. If we get a chance to get into radioactivity, 
and nuclear reactions, we'll talk, be able to talk about different methods of geological dating. But basically, it all has to do with the, um, we can date rocks, how old rocks are, by looking at ratio of certain isotopes in them. Different isotopes have different stabilities. So we, we've talked about how if you have the wrong number of neutrons relative to protons, they, they decay, right? They break up into smaller pieces. But not every radioactive decay happens at the same rate. So if you know that a certain that when a rock was formed, it started with a certain level of, of say uranium two thirty five, because it's a an ore that was made from uranium and uranium two thirty five naturally in the solar system is at a certain level, um, and then you can look at well uranium two thirty five over the process over the course of four point five billion years turns into lead two oh six I think. If you look at the ratio in a rock of lead 206 to uranium 235, you can actually work backwards from knowing what that rate of decay is to figure out how much time has passed. It's the same math that's involved in carbon dating. Um, geological dating is dealing with longer times and paleontology like fossils is dealing with mineral formation, not living, not stuff that's currently living. So you don't use carbon dating when you're looking at fossils, you use geological dating, which is the exact same principles, um, just using different isotopes, not using carbon-13. You're using stuff like uranium or uh, potassium, different, different radioactive isotopes that have certain half-lives that are known and well-measured. Um, so you can, but, and then basically if you know, even if you, the fossil formed, isn't doesn't have any of those specific um, radio isotopes. You can also look at it in terms of well, I know that it's in this geological layer. Everything in this geological layer had to have been deposited at close to the same amount of time ago. And so, if you can date any of the rocks in that layer, you can say, well, it's pretty safe to assume that if this rock is sixty-five million years old, the fossil that's buried right next to it is also sixty-five million years old. Um, and so a lot of times when it comes to the paleontology, you're, you're dating things based on what layer they're buried in, not necessarily dating the fossil itself. Um, and that, that goes into, it seems a little bit like that circular logic because you're dating the rock, not the fossil. So how can we know that the fossil is buried in the right, um, in the right layer or like, how, how do we justify that? And basically it's really, really really strong circumstantial evidence, if you put it in legal terms. But yes, we can't explicitly say this fossil is this age, but every other fossil of this same species is found in the same layer uh, geologically, and every rock in that layer that we can date is all from the same time period. That's a strong enough circumstantial evidence that we've never been able to find anything that disputes that that logic, even though it's not dating its fossils explicitly, um, it's close enough. It's good enough uh, in terms of probability. And um, anyway, we'll get to, we'll get to do some of those examples hopefully in uh, in a couple weeks. So let's pick up where we left off. We talked about formal charge of chlorate on, as an example on uh, Friday. So let's do perchlorate instead. And then we'll look at nitric acid as well. So what's the formula for perchlorate? ClO4, one minus. Everybody's got all those down by now, right? Ready for the quiz on Thursday? Good. If not, we've still got a couple days to fret about it, to worry about it, to get better at it, more like, right? Get it all nailed down. All right, how many, first off, what are we gonna put in the middle? An oxygen or a chlorine? And why? There's only one of them? That's a good hint. That doesn't, that's not the foolproof answer though, because in N2O, there's the nitrogen that goes in the middle. So it's not, it's a good, usually that's the case, but if we want to know for sure, we look at those electronegativity values. 
Remember, we're going to put what whatever goes in the middle has to be willing to share more than everything else. So whatever has the lowest electronegativity goes in the middle. So let me put up that value, those values real quick. We remind ourselves what we're looking at. Download it. All right, so chlorine, 3.16 electronegativity value. Oxygen, 3.44. Which one is more electronegative? So which one's going to share more? Chlorine's going to share more, so chlorine goes in the middle. So, Josie, you were right, but we also want to double check. And this is the foolproof way to double check, is check your electronegativities. Chlorine goes in the middle, surrounded by oxygens. How many valence electrons do we have to work with? Seven from the chlorine. Each oxygen has how many? Six. And then we have a charge, so we have, we have to adjust to that, right? Negative one means we get one extra electron, right? So plus one electron from the charge. So that gives us 24 plus another eight, so 32. Uh, how many electrons did we use? We used eight, so we've got another 24 left. How many does each, each oxygen still need? Needs to gain an additional six. So six times four is 24. So that's going to take all of our electrons, right? Is this, the, is this a valid Lewis Dahl structure? What's our first criteria? Number of electrons. Because we can't make matter out of nothing, right? What's the second criteria? Everything with the full valence. So if it satisfies the first two criteria, then it's a it's a valid Lewis dot structure. It might not be the best Lewis dot structure, but what's the third criteria? The least important of our criteria. Formal charge. Right, and that's where we compare, we treat each of these bonds like it's half, like they're, um, it owns half of those electrons and all lone pairs count for, for their full value. We compare to what it has on the periodic table, right? So each oxygen has, it owns how many? They're all identical, so you can do this all at once, right? So each oxygen has six in the form of lone pairs that it owns outright, and it's splitting another two. So that means each oxygen has seven electrons owned and six on the periodic table, right? So what's the formal charge on the oxygens? How many does the chlorine own? It doesn't own any outright. It owns four because it has eight electrons that it owns half of them. And on the periodic table, it has how many valence electrons? Seven, so it lost three electrons then, right? And again, what's our what's our way we can double check we did formal charge right? Formal charges for everything added up are supposed to equal what? Negative 
the charge of the entire thing, right? So if it's a molecule, if it's neutral, they should add up to zero. In this case, because this is a polyatomic ion, they should add up to negative one. Do they? Yeah, and we have four at minus one, because each oxygen is a minus one. And then we have a plus three. So it adds up to a minus one, which is what it should look like. Can we get these formal charges closer to zero, though? How could we get the formal charges closer to zero? Remember, chlorine's in the third row of the periodic table, which means it can do what? It can get more than eight electrons. Third row of the periodic table and down, you're not, you have to have at least eight electrons to have a full valence, but you can have more than that if it lowers the overall formal charge. So start by taking some of these oxygen lone pairs and turn them into a double bond. Now, all the oxygens with single bonds are still minus one, but that oxygen is zero. And that makes the chlorine go from plus three to what? What's the formal charge now? It has 10 electrons around it that are all shared, which makes it Formal, it has five electrons owned, which gives it a plus two charge. Is that a question or were you saying five? Okay. So that was better. We got this plus three down to plus two. Closer to zero is more stable. That's a good start. We have more oxygens that are negative one, and we have a plus two here. We can get that closer to zero, though, right? Let's do it again. Now the chlorine owns six electrons, which gives it a plus one, right? See where we're going with this? One more time. Now three of our oxygens are all have formal charge zero. Chlorine has formal charge zero. One oxygen is minus one. Can we improve on that? Not, not really. We can't really get, something has to have a negative one charge, right? Because the overall molecule has a negative one charge. So if we get to where everything is zero, except one atom is a minus one, that's about as good as we can do for a polyatomic ion like this. All right. I think we've done a fair bit of practice with formal charge now. So I think, are we feeling pretty good about Lewis dot structures? Ish, as long as I'm the one up here with the marker anyway. That's how it always goes though. You'll get there. Yeah. So are you thinking of like the, the noble gas example we did? In that case, I kind of pulled that out of nowhere. Um, but in general, those, the, I would either have to give you the electronegativity. Um, and really, if you, basically, if you know what the most electronegative elements are, which are nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and chlorine, those four are almost never going to be in the middle unless they're with something that's more, that's closer to fluorine. So the only time oxygen could ever be in the middle um, is if it was surrounded by fluorines or if it's surrounded by hydrogens because hydrogens can only make how many bonds? Just one bond for a hydrogen, right? Hydrogen only needs to gain one electron. So hydrogens can really truly never be in the middle because you can't put something in the middle if it can only make one bond, right? Sort of by definition, it's, it has to be at the end of something, not never in the middle. Um, other than that though, whatever is closest to fluorine is more electronegative in general. And if you have 
oxygen, it's, it's most of our polyatomic ions are going to be oxygen based. And so it's going to be something with a bunch of oxygens around it. And so oxygens are almost never going to go in the middle. No problem. And fluorines really will never go in the middle. What about nitric acid? How can we do a Lewis dot structure? What's the best Lewis dot structure we could make for nitric acid? What's that gonna look like? We could just put nitrogen in the middle, put three oxygens and a hydrogen around it. That's one possibility. Nitric acid is based on what polyatomic ion though? Nitrate, we did nitrate as an example on Friday, right? Nitrate looks like looked like this, and then these two oxygens. So that was as good as we could get this. We can't get, what's the formal charge on nitrogen here? It owns four, that's five on the periodic table. So this leaves the nitrogen as a plus one. And we have two oxygens, an oxygen with only one bond is gonna be minus one. Could we tweak this structure like we did with the perchlorate? Can we just make another double bond with the oxygen? Why not? Second row. Second row of the periodic table doesn't have a d orbital. I mean, it does, but not for a whole nother energy level, right? So you can't break the octet rule. You can't go past eight electrons for nitro nitrogen only for elements that are in the third row of the periodic table or below. With our acids, go back to our nomenclature. We took, if we were trying to make an acid, it was basically an ionic compound where we had hydrogen acting as the, as the cation, right? So we, this nitric acid is nitrate with an H plus. If the nitrogen is a plus one and the oxygen is a minus one, where is the where is an H plus gonna stick? Is it gonna be attracted as a, something with a positive charge could be attracted here? No. It's gonna be attracted to one of these one of these oxygens that has a negative charge. So Sometimes we don't have just one central atom. Our first guess for nitric acid was this, right? Because all of the examples we've done so far were pick one central atom and then you just surround it with everything else, right? And this is, we could satisfy the first two criteria here. but we can do a better job if we rearrange what's in the middle or what the, what the hydrogen is attached to. So sometimes it's a little bit more creative than just stick your less your least ele electronegative element in the middle and surround it with everything else. We're gonna start getting to larger atoms or larger molecules, excuse me. And those larger molecules sometimes have more than one atom we could think of as the central atom. You've got a nitrogen attached to an oxygen and then the oxygen is attached to something else. If we do it this way, we can actually keep these, um, these formal charges lower, right? The nitrogen is still a plus one here, but that oxygen is zero and so is this oxygen. 
and so is the hydrogen. All have formal charges of zero. If we did it this way, we have three oxygens that are all negative one. Actually, I think we run out of electrons. We had to do, had to be like that, but still. That also breaks our octet rule though, right? We actually can't even satisfy the first two. If we actually went through the process and counted electrons up. We can't satisfy all of our criteria. I think really what would wind up having, happening is we'd wind up with an oxygen that didn't have a full valence. If we tried to do it this way, we'd run out of electrons before we could fill all the valences for oxygen even. So the only way we can do it is by rearranging things a little bit, right? Which will take some practice. But in general, with these polyatomic ions, if you take a polyatomic ion and you make it into an acid, they're all gonna look pretty similar. The polyatomic ion Lewis dot structure doesn't really change. You just take one of those oxygens around the outside and you stick an extra H plus on it, right? So you don't generally see something like this. All right, uh, why are we spending so much time on this? Well, one, Lewis dot structures are kind of tricky in the sense that it kind of feels like we're just kind of making stuff up as we go. Um, and I get that. I'm coming at this with a lot more years of practice with this and having seen this so many times. Um, I, but I still remember, and I try to remind myself every year what it felt like to learn these rules the first time. And it always felt like, oh, I, got, I finally got a handle on things. And then so the instructor pulls something out of nowhere. And I have no idea where it came from or why. Um, so while I don't have an antidote to that, just uh, please bear in mind, I do remember what that felt like. And I'm going to try and explain the rules in a way that makes as much sense as I can. All right. This is where we ended the other day. We said, okay, when we're talking about these Vesper geometries, anybody remember what Vesper stood for? It was not actually in the right order the letters were funky. B S E P R. I don't know, maybe that was just me and my group of friends in high school that called it Vesper. But if you say Vesper geometry, then most chemists will know what you're talking about. What was it, Kai? Valence shell, electron, pair, repulsion. Basically just the idea that electrons push away other electrons. Things try to spread out as much as possible. Right, and if things are trying to spread out as much as possible, but they're still limited by the fact that they have to be able to be attached to the, the central atom. All right, so what does that look like? Well, if you have to have them surrounding a central atom, but they're also trying to stay as far away from each other as possible, regardless of how long your arms are, the furthest apart you can get your hands is 180 degrees from each other, right? If you think of your body as the central atom, it doesn't matter if you have long arms or short arms, everybody's long, the largest distance you could possibly get your two hands apart from each other is 180 degrees from each other, right? Bonds behave the same way. They instinctively try to stay as far away from me, not instinctively, that's the wrong word. Um, naturally, they naturally stay as far apart as possible because they're pushing each other away. So if you have two clouds of electrons, we call electron domains, um, they are 180 degrees apart. If you have three, that's the example we looked at earlier. Three electron groups are going to try and stay about 120 degrees from each other. And we ended with, well, what do we do with four? How many degrees can they be apart from each other? We ended with it's not 90, right? Because we're not stuck in two dimensions. We looked at CH3, methane, Lewis dot structure, we naturally draw it like this because we draw it on two-dimensional space, which would put them 90 degrees from each other. 
However, we can actually get things a little bit further apart if we use all three dimensions. So this didn't work the other day. You can see how if you put a carbon in the middle and surround it by four other bonds, those bonds will move apart from each other, not 90 degrees. They can actually be about 109 degrees. It's actually one where it seems like it's this nice, neat analytical geometry. It seems like there should be an exact number. There's an exact number for 180 degrees, an exact number for 120 degrees. It's actually, it's 109.5 something. It's, it's a non, I think it's an irrational number even, um, where it's further apart than just 90 degrees because we have three dimensions to work in. All right, so these different geometries, these are actually what lead to the molecular shapes. And you have to be able to do the Lewis dot structures to figure out how many electron domains you have, how many things you have taking up space around a central atom. If you know you have four things taking up space around a central atom, you know that the shape is always gonna look like that. If you have three things taking up space around a central atom, you know that it's always going to look like they're approximately 120 degrees from each other, right? Depending on what those three things or those four things are, they might not be exactly perfectly symmetrical like this. Um, if you can imagine replacing one of those hydrogens with something bigger, like a chlorine. A chlorine is not the same size as a hydrogen and it has lone pairs around it too, right? So a chlorine is actually, if you replace one of these with something else, then you get asymmetry, which will become important when we start talking about polarity of a molecule. Basically asymmetry, it still looks symmetric in terms of like, it seems like, oh, I could put a mirror down the middle of it and that would make it look symmetric, right? But because one of these four things is different than the others, one of these things is not like the others. One of these things just doesn't belong. You know, Sesame Street. When did Sesame Street get taken off of PBS? You guys grew up with Sesame Street? Okay. At least we still have that cultural touchstone. Um, my kids won't know what Sesame Street even is, other than the count, because everybody loves the count. Um, I, I, it was a proud, proud dad moment when my 10-year-old started was trying to teach the the baby how to count. He goes, one boat, ah, ah, ah. He'd be really happy. Um, that's how I know that I'm doing a good job, parent. They've never seen Sesame Street, but they know who the count is. All right. So basically when we have these Vesper geometries, we have a series and we say geometry is plural because every different number of electrons around your central atom is gonna give you a different shape based on what the geometry is. How many things do you have taking up space around that central, that central atom? Um, and the terminology gets a little bit tricky. Um, the best description, it's not exactly saying the number of, of electron pairs because when you have something like this molecule here, how many, how many electron pairs are around that carbon? Four, how many things do you have taking up space though? Just three, because this double bond is stuck in the same space. It's all in one area. So even though it's two pairs, it's one electron area. And so that's why I like the term electron domain. An electron domain is just the space that a group of electrons is taking up. And that group could be one pair. It could be two pairs. If it was a triple bond, it could be three pairs. I think that what's important is it's all in the same area of space. All right, so if you have two electron domains, you're always going to get something linear. If you have three electron domains, it's going to have that roughly 120 degrees. This one's not going to be exactly 120 degrees because the oxygen is 
bigger than the hydrogens are, like we just talked about, but it's going to be about 120 degrees. That shape has a name. We call it trigonal planar. Trigonal for three, planar means flat. So it just means it's, it's a flat triangle shape. All of these different geometries have different names. I'm not going to be super picky on making you memorize these names. Let's see if I can. actually see those ones at the bottom, kind of. What I am going to be picking on is if you're not going to give me the name on a test, I am going to have to ask you to draw it with approximately the right bond angles. So you can either draw it or have the names memorized. But either way, you need to be able to describe what the shape is. If that, that gets tricky, it's easy enough to draw them with the right, approximately the right bond angles when you've got everything in two dimensions, when it's planar. Right, drawing things in three dimensions, well, we have whole art classes for that, but I don't expect everybody to be artists. In fact, most might, you might shock you to learn this. Most chemists are not known for their artistic skills. Um, so what we do instead is we just have a series of sort of shorthand to show something as either coming out of the board or going into the board or at, into your paper, behind your paper or in front of your paper. And the way we do that is with these called wedges and dashes. So if I was drawing Lewis dot structure for methane, just make them about um, 90 degrees from each other. I'm trying to show the three dimensional shape. And draw it like this. This is a wedge. It's just a triangle where the big end of the triangle, draw it like a, a really skinny isosceles triangle where the big end of the triangle is what's pointing out towards you. If you can visualize it, if you think of the pond as being a, a rectangle, take one end of that rectangle and move it towards you, it looks bigger, right? So that the big end of the triangle is pointed towards you. And then you kind of just do the opposite, but you do it with these dotted lines to indicate that bond is getting smaller. It's behind the board. All right, so it takes a little practice. If you, you know, if you squint your eyes and tilt your head funny, you can kind of, kind of looks like showing perspective a little bit um, if you use your imagination. Not literally squint your eyes and tilt your head. I don't think that will actually help. You have to use your imagination. You have to know kind of what you're looking at. I want to say this is the first time I've ever seen that. Usually people don't take me at my word when I say that. <laughs> it wasn't just one of you, too. That was impressive. Um, so these, this, this shape, we call a tetrahedral shape. What's tetra mean? Four. We learned that with our nomenclature, right? I don't, I don't think I made the point. Did I make the tetra, Tetris reference? Everybody knows what Tetris is, right? All of the pieces in Tetris are made of four blocks arranged differently. So where Tetris gets its name is from the Greek word for four, tetra. And at least in my group of friends, when you finally got the long skinny one and you could clear four rows at once, they called, we called that getting a Tetris because you got four rows at once. So tetra means four. Hedral, a polyhedron is a three-dimensional shape, right? It's the three-dimensional equivalent of a polygon. Polygon is two-dimensional. A polyhedron is three-dimensional. So tetrahedral shape. It's basically, if you think about connecting all of these hydrogens, make every um, three of these hydrogens into a triangle, you're, you're basically connecting four triangles in the shape of a three-sided pyramid. Well, technically, it's a four-sided pyramid, but you, usually if we're talking about that our, our tetrahedron is one, two side on the back and the side on the bottom, four sides. So a tetrahedral shape 
uh, geometry puts the carbon in the middle and then each point is a hydrogen. You just don't see these lines in between them. So for any, any Dungeons and Dragons players, it's a D4. A four-sided die is a tetrahedral geometry with your central atom in the middle. Um, if you have five electron domains, let's see. I'm trying to think what's a good example off the top of my head. I, we have some examples coming up in a few minutes, but either way, whatever you put at the middle, when you have five things taking up space, five electron domains, basically, you get a trigonal planar shape where it's flat like a triangle, so about 120 degrees between each of these. And then 90 degrees to that plane. Plane is a flat surface, right? You've got your triangle shape in the middle that's into the board and out of the board. 90 degrees to that straight up and straight down, you add a fourth and a fifth object, fourth and a fifth domain. Right, so can everybody see the triangle shape here? And then you get, if you connected those, you would get this triangle with a point in the middle. It's not quite going to be a D6, but it's going to look kind of like a D6. And then last but not least, the largest object that we're going to deal with, the most electron domains we're going to deal with, is an octahedral shape. Uh, in this one, I do have a good example. Sulfur hexafluoride. Sulfur hexafluoride, its Lewis dot structure winds up looking like this. This one you do just get to surround it with all the all the fluorines. And then when you count up all your valence electrons, you get enough electrons to fill all the fluorine valences and then you run out. So all the fluorines have, have a formal charge of zero and the sulfur has a formal charge of zero. It's got 12 electrons, which looks weird to us, but it's in the third row of the periodic table. So we're, al we're allowed to do that. And it owns six electrons here, right? How many does it own on the periodic table? Six. So this actually has a formal charge of zero on the sulfur, which means it's relatively stable, despite the fact that we had to break the octet rule to get there. The shape of this is a lot like the trigonal, the um, five electron domains, which I didn't say that the name for that one. Doesn't want to let me zoom in. That's annoying. Um, trigonal bipyramidal is that five sided when you have it's trigonal because it's got that plane in the middle that has three things attached, not attached, three things in that that middle plane. And they say bipyramid bipyramidal or trigonal bipyramid because it looks like a three sided pyramid stacked on top of another three sided pyramid. If it's six things attached, the easiest way to visualize this is to think of this as being a square. And then from the middle of the square, you pop one atom up, one atom down. So in this case, everything is 90 degrees from everything else. Because in this plane that's, that's flat like this, these four fluorines are all 90 degrees from each other, making a nice square shape. And then 90 degrees from that is another bond. So basically this looks like X, Y, and Z um, axes in a three-dimensional graph. 
think about what that shape looks like. All three of those axes are 90 degrees from each other, right? So there's, let's I always get it wrong. Right hand rule, X, Y, and Z. Right, so just in terms of what that shape looks like, you get this, um, this setup where everything's 90 degrees, which gives it, um, despite the fact there's only six things attached to that sulfur, it actually makes a polyhedron that has eight sides. So we call it an octahedral shape. And again, for those of you who, who play board games, that's a D8, an eight-sided die. that looks like two square pyramids stacked on top of each other. One, like think of the pyramids from Egypt. You picture one of those pyramids up and then one of those pyramids on the bottom side pointing downward. That's the shape that you get here. All right, so we have our, our lab this week will be another computer computer based lab on Thursday um, where we'll actually build some of these geometries and rather than just draw them with these bonds, it'll actually let you make some of those figures kind of like that rotating methane figure from earlier. So you'll get to click around and, and it's not, not what we consider wet chemistry in terms of actually making solutions or lighting things on fire, but it's better than just doing a worksheet as far as you actually still have to go through the process and click and drag. Um, again, it's just, I haven't found anything better in terms of being able to visualize these shapes in 3D than actually building them and um, on Wednesday, I'll actually, I think I have some molecular, there's some molecular model kits here too. So in addition to doing it on the computer screen, you can also, you would rather put together the little plastic pieces um, to build these different shapes to see what they look like. So you can hold them, turn them around um, and get some practice with this. Uh, that's what our lab is going to be working on this week. <clears throat> All right, so in addition, the other thing that, the reason this is not just a list of six, why it's this um, table shape, is because we can't actually see lone pairs, but they still take up space. So if we think about the Lewis dot structure for water, looks like this. These lone pairs still count as electron domains. They still take away, take up space and push away other electrons, but we can't see them because the way we have of experimentally measuring these geometries basically involves, you make, turn these things into a crystal structure and then you bounce x-rays off of them, kind of like the Rutherford gold foil experiment. And based on the angles that these electrons, these x-rays bounce off, you can work backwards with trigonometry and sine and cosine and a whole bunch of geometry. You can work backward and figure out what the distances are from all the different nuclei. And if you know where the distances are from all the nuclei, you can figure out what the geometry is, what the bond angles are. The problem with that is electrons don't diffract X-rays because they have no mass. They don't have a nucleus, I should say. If it doesn't have a nucleus, it doesn't show up in X-ray crystallography. So we know that they must be there because they still take up space. They still push the other electrons away, but we can't see them. And so that's why we have these other categories in this chart where we say, okay, well, the, the electron geometry is always gonna be from this first column where all you're doing is count up how many things are taking up space. It's always gonna be one of these. But if some of those electron domains are lone pairs, then the geometry, the what we could call the molecular geometry is gonna look a little bit different. And so for, if we, for this case, we have four electron domains around the oxygen, right? So it's electron geometry is tetrahedral. Everything's roughly 109 degrees apart from each other. But if two of them are lone pairs, we can't see that. And so we actually call this molecular geometry bent because it looks like there's only two atoms that there are only two atoms attached to this oxygen but they're not 180 degrees from each other 
So something must be taking up that extra space. It must be lone pairs taking up that space. And so we give that a different name. So the molecular geometry in this case is bent. And the, but the electron geometry, we'd still just call it tetrahedral. So basically, you need to be able to draw these Lewis dot structures if you want to know what all the bond angles are. And the bond angles wind up being important for things like predicting if a molecule is polar. We talked on Friday about how to tell whether a bond was polar. But for a molecule, for the entire molecule to be polar, that would mean that part of this molecule was partially positive and part, part of it was partially negative because the electrons aren't being shared even, right? It turns out that's all based on electronegativity and asymmetry. So if we want to know if this is a polar molecule, it has two criteria. And, you, and for this one, it's not in order of importance. For this one, if it's a polar molecule, you have to be able to say yes to both of these things. Does it have polar bonds? And two, does it have asymmetry? If you can say yes to both of those things, it's a polar molecule. And polar molecules have certain properties that are really important in lab and in research and just understanding how their properties work. Um, boiling point, viscosity, how sticky things are, all have to do with how polar the molecule is. So if we want to know if this is a polar molecule, you have to go through a couple steps. You have to draw the Lewis dot structure because from the Lewis dot structure, you can figure out the geometry. And from the geometry and that list of polarity of electronegativities, we can figure out if it has polar bonds. Right? So this is all building towards that overall goal of being able to tell if a molecule is polar because that tells us something about the physical properties. So... Does anybody remember what the criteria was for polar bonds? What made a bond polar? Larger than 1.8 was an ionic bond, right? And then if it was larger, a difference in electronegativity than carbon and hydrogen, it was um, polar, but still covalent. Right, so all we're trying to see is, okay, well, I know that when I drew my low thought structure, I found out I had to have, I had to have oxygen and hydrogen bonds. So all we do is we go back to our table of electronegativities. And if it's a greater than a 1.8 difference, then it's an ionic bond. If it's between 0.4 and 1.8, it's a polar bond. So oxygen 3.44, hydrogen can't quite see, it's 2.20. So that's a difference of more than one, but less than two, right? So yes, water has polar bonds. Does it have asymmetry? That's a tricky one, because it looks still looks pretty symmetric, doesn't it? It does have an internal line of symmetry, where you can say it's the same on both sides, right? But it's still, it's not symmetric in the mathematical sense because basically if something, for something to be symmetric, everything surrounding the central atom has to be the same or at least exactly opposite in opposite directions where they can cancel each other out. So in this case, because we have two lone pairs, in two oxygen hydrogen polar bonds, it has asymmetry. This side of the molecule is going to be partially positive. And this side of the molecule is going to be partially negative. So it has polar bonds and it has asymmetry, which makes the whole molecule polar. And this is why water has such a high boiling point, 
most molecules the same weight as water is are going to boil. Yes, what's the next closest one? Uh, liquid nitrogen is bigger than this. Usually bigger molecules we would think of as having higher boiling points, but nit liquid nitrogen boils at 78 Kelvin, minus 200 Celsius. Water has a 300 degree Celsius higher boiling point because it's polar. Right, so understanding, being able to answer these questions is sort of the whole goal of one, drawing these Lewis dot structures, one of the applications of Lewis dot structures. Um, so, and once we can draw the Lewis dot structures, we can start talking about things like geometries and molecular shape. And if you're interested in biochemistry or medicine, molecular shape winds up being really important because essentially the entire field of modern medicine, of pharmaceutical design is based on how do we make molecules that fit this active site on a protein well, but not too well. How do we make a molecule that fits in this exact shape and without being too close to the same shape? And figuring out these geometries is a big chunk of how they do that. All right. Let me out of this one for a second. All right, so the next topic, I want to start talking about chemical reactions. How well do you guys remember stoichiometry? You remember that it's there and that you didn't like it? Um, that's usually about how it goes at first. Um, we're going to get into stoichiometry and actually doing chemical reactions now. I can get to my All right, so in the in the slides as well there's also some some better drawings um I don't expect you to be able to draw them this well you just have to use the wedges and the dashes if you're drawing these geometries in 3d um but just to give you a better idea physically of what they're what you're looking at um, and showing those names. Uh, and like I said, we'll get more practice. The more practice you get with these, this isn't something that, that I'm going to quiz you on the names because for being able to draw them with the right bond angles is just as good as long as you can do it consistently. It's one of those things that I actually did wind up memorizing when I was a student just because it was faster than drawing the geometries was easier once you got the hang of hang of it and once you knew what the language was at the very least for the for the electron geometries for this first column knowing these is going to save you a lot of time because it's uh, a lot even though it's you know long really obnoxious words like trigonal by pyramid by pyramid um, it's still faster than drawing these in, and trying to guess at the angles off the top of your head um, that said, it's one of those where as you continue to do this, you're gonna you're gonna wind up memorizing the ones that you see a lot anyway, just from the usage, just like your conversion sheet. All right, so there's some more practice here for predict for predicting molecular geometry. We'll work on some of those on well, we'll answer these ones, work through the process on uh, Wednesday. And the other aspect of this that I want you to think about with this is once you get the geometries down, figure out if it's a polar molecule or not. Ask these two questions. Does it have polar bonds? Does it have asymmetry? Because that's the next step. Once you get the geometry, one of the easiest, the easiest things to wrap your head around that we can actually test you on. I'm not going to test you on pharmaceutical design for this class. Um, is going to be, now that you did that, can you apply it and tell me if it's a polar molecule or not? All right, so let's talk about chemical reactions. Just to lay down the, the um, 
vocabulary. We're going to cover this relatively quickly because I know you've had stoichiometry before. Um, I'm not going to belabor the whole food analogy. Um, we all use food analogies to teach. It's not everybody. Um, the most common analogies that I see used in by other chemistry teachers to teach stoichiometry is always food. Um, I've seen people use cars as analogies. Uh, what are some of, have you seen some other ones? Grilled cheese. Grilled cheese. I go, I tend to go hamburger as my analogy, but grilled cheese. I've used, I've used tacos before, but then you get into, you wind up getting sidetracked in debates about does the, does the slaw count as an ingredient? Do you need to list that? And then what's the ratio of vinegar? It's proper for that, um, for the pickled onions and things like that. Um, so I stay away from Mexican food because there's a lot of very, very vehement opinions about the right way to do Mexican food sometimes. Um, anyway, when we're talking about chemical reactions, it's a lot like following recipes in a lot of ways. So that's why we tend to go that route. Um, the ingredients that you start with, we call the reactants or sometimes reagents. Those two terms are identical. Um, there are some cases, I almost always say reactants, but occasionally I'll still slip up in certain places and say uh, reagent. Um, literally the exact same thing, just reagents, so, sort, of the, sort of the more archaic form of saying reactant. Um, everybody says products though. And then that reaction arrow indicates what's basically before and after. You have a before and after, the reaction arrow indicates that there is a change. Right? And so there's sometimes the reaction arrow will have some other information around it. Um, occasionally you'll see a reaction arrow drawn like this. The delta in this case means heat. Sometimes you'll see uh, other catalysts uh, written around it. We'll talk about what the, all that means. The important thing is, is that you have a before and after if you have a chemical reaction arrow. The only other part of this that's tricky at all, now that we know what the, these formulas mean, the other thing is that usually in a chemical reaction, in a complete chemical reaction, we'll also list the phase of the various um, reactants and products. So if it's G, and it's basically just written as a subscript in parentheses um, after the formula, G for gas, L for liquid, S for solid. Um, the other one that's really common, it's not technically a different phase, is if you have something in a water-based solution, you say that it's aqueous. So AQ literally just means dissolved in water. And sometimes you can have reactions happening in the aqueous phase. And so sometimes you just have water around to allow things to move around to keep get things dissolved. It's not really necessarily part of the reaction though. So we don't write plus water on anything that we just say, oh, if you see aqueous, that just means it's dissolved in water and water is not necessarily a part of the reaction. Um, if you have a, a uh, and this is part of, what is the phrase I've heard? Water chauvinism. Um, Earth is a water chauvinistic society. We think water is more important than other solvents because there's more water around as a solvent than most other solvents. Um, and so water as a solvent gets its own phase, um, but there are other solvents that could be there. They don't have their own indicator. So if something was dissolved in benzene, for instance, you there is no subscript that you could use to say dissolved in benzene. Um, if we lived on a planet where the dominant liquid was was ammonia, for instance, like on, I think, is it Titan? One of, one of the moons of Jupiter is mostly uh, nitrogen-based. It has liquid, liquid ammonia, and it has weather systems, even. You have clouds of ammonia and ammonia falling as rain and precipitation and ammonia as solid. Um, it's a lot colder because the freezing point and melting point of ammonia are really, really cold compared to Earth. But in that case, we would probably have a subscript that indicated dissolved in ammonia instead of dissolved in water. But because we live on Earth, we have aqueous. Um, there's nothing inherently special about water that, that warrants that other than the fact we live on Earth.
not true chauvinism, just that's that's the phrase that gets used. People all use still use that term chauvinism to mean our um, metric chauvinism when you you know if you think the metric system is better than other unit systems because it is um, you might be called a metric chauvinist. Anyway, tells you tells you what kind of online forums I spent too much time on in college. Um, that that was a common a common phrase that was used. Anyway. We do still have to take into account that we can't destroy or create atoms at this point. We're not doing nuclear reactions yet. So when we have a, re a chemical reaction happen, we have to have the same number of atoms before and after. And not just the same number of atoms, the same types of atoms. They don't all have to be in the same shape. So we can have a different number of molecules before and after, but the same number of atoms have to be there before and after. So if you look at this reaction the way it was written, this is combustion of butane. So uh, a lighter burns butane in the presence of oxygen, makes CO2 and water. Well, if butane has four carbons in it and CO2 only has one carbon in it. So if we're gonna still have just as many carbon atoms before and after, how many CO2 molecules do we have to make? We're gonna to have to make more than one at least, right? Um, and so that that process is called balancing the reaction. Does anybody remember what the numbers you put in front of the chemicals are called? Yeah, coefficients, good. So if we're trying to balance this equation. It's, it's feels like glorified guess and check at first. It's not guess and check. There is mathematical process behind it, but until you've taken linear algebra, it's hard to explain exactly what the mathematical process is. Um, but it's basically a system of equations. The easiest way at this point to solve it though is basically go through and pick a, an element and make sure that element is balanced by saying, okay, well, if I have four carbons here and my only carbon source in the product has one carbon in it, I've got to make four of them. And then you just pick another element and balance that one. And typically the, the, you wanna leave the one for last that has, that's all by itself. If I change, if I balance my carbons and then I had to go back and change this again, now my carbons aren't balanced anymore, right? So usually we, we leave the one for last that doesn't affect anything else. So how many water molecules do we have to make? Five. There's a total of 10 hydrogens here. Each water molecule has two hydrogens, so we need to make five of them. Five times two gives us a total of 10. How confident do we feel about balancing reactions like this? Give me, everybody just give me a thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs medium, medium, medium to, to plus. All right, we'll keep practicing. We won't spend a ton of time, but we have lots of practice coming up for balancing. So we should get those, those mediums feeling more confident soon. Um, what do we do with the oxygens now? Our carbons are balanced, our hydrogens are balanced. How many oxygens do we need? Mm, we need a total of... 13 oxygen atoms, but we can only add even numbers of oxygens here. Well, what's, what is one way if you, if you start with an odd number and you want it to be even and you can do one, one mathematical operation to it, times it by two. If you times something by two, it always winds up even, right? So all the ones that we started with that are already balanced, all of our carbons and, and hydrogens, just double all of those coefficients. Our carbons are still balanced, eight and eight. Our hydrogens are still balanced, 20 and 20. And now we have an even number of oxygens on the right-hand side. 
we add up all the oxygens. It was 13, we doubled everything. So now it's 26. So we need 13 O2s. Basically balancing reactions doesn't get too tricky until you have, have the same element showing up in two different things over here. Um, or in both places over here. What's a good example? Uh, we, won't, we won't jump straight, straight to the scary ones. There's some where it takes a little bit more creative thinking and they can solve them mathematically if you know linear algebra um, and how to use matrices. The math, the math teachers at the college are always trying to get me to, to teach linear algebra in my chemistry class is the best possible way for balancing reactions. But most of the time, just going through guess and check basically like this is a lot faster than plugging it into a matrix. Maybe that's just because I didn't do very well in my linear algebra class in college. Um, but this way will always work and you can always double check your answers. All you have to do is make sure you've got the same number of every atom on both sides. Right, so once it's properly balanced, we have eight carbons, 20 hydrogens, 26 oxygens on each side and they match up. If you mess up in balancing, you might not be able to get the right answer, but at the very least, you should know you messed up, right? It's it's easy to check your work on this one. Uh, I guess it's also easy to mess up if you screw up the arithmetic or just count wrong in your head. That's easy to do too, I suppose. But um, at the very least, and I will take this as an opportunity on my tests. If you if there's a test, we're going to do some stoichiometry problems on the midterm. And if you can't, part of that is you have to start by balancing balancing, blah, blah, balancing the reactions. If you can't balance the reaction, um, I don't still don't want to take away all the points for that entire question. So you can say, if you recognize, hey, I didn't balance this right, but I can't figure out why it's not balancing right, I'm just going to use these numbers to do the rest of the problem, even though that's wrong. I could only have to mark you down for not balancing the reaction, right? You can do the rest of the process right, all you have to do is say, I think I did this wrong and I'm not sure why, but I'm going to keep moving on anyway. Do the rest of the problem. Don't get hung up on the balancing and leave a blank page is what I'm saying. Continue with the rest of the problem. At the very least, I can give you most of the points for that, right? Um, unfortunately, I've not come up with a good way to give partial credit for blank space. So don't give me blank space. Don't turn in empty problems. And I can at least give you, even if it's gibberish, tell me a chemistry joke. And I can give you one point out of 10. If you give me a blank page, I have to give you a zero, right? It might not be much, depending on how bad the chemistry joke is. And I would prefer you at least attempt it be a problem. But give me something, and I can help you. The chemistry joke is a if it's one, if it's a good one and I haven't heard it before, then I'll consider giving you an extra credit point. I've, I've heard most of them though. And you know what they say, thing about chemistry joke is it's tough because all the good ones are gone. So that's the level you just have to rise above that level. Um, so there's some more practice. Is this the one that there's some tricky, there's a tricky one on here? Uh, so these ones aren't too bad. I think I took the tricky one out. It gets really, really tricky if I make a typo. Oh. I think there was a typo in this problem to begin with, and I had to add the two of NO2. Yeah, B, B was impossible to solve because there was a typo in one of the formulas. Um, but basically, because you have nitrogen showing up in two different places and in different ratios in the product, it was a really, really tricky one to solve anyway. But there's some good practice problems there. All right, we only have a couple minutes left. So we're just going to, mm, what should we do with the few minutes we have left? Chemistry, chemistry jokes. All right, all right, hit me. Who's got a chemistry joke? Emma. Uh, 
That's assault. That's assault. I like that one. I have heard that one before, though. Um, oh, shoot. What was the other one? Two Adams are walking down the street, and one of them says, I think you dropped an electron. I think I lost an electron. The other one says, are you sure? And the person says, I'm positive. Uh -huh. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> 